Hi Chris, it's Nick Earls here. I'm uh, reading this book at the moment, up to page 62 right now. And, and I've got to say, it's it's breathtaking in terms of its scope. Uh, it's, it's a regular sized novel in terms of the number of pages, but it's definitely mammoth in terms of its reach and what you've stretched out to and absorbed in order to write this thing. If I could ask you one thing about it, it would be I'd like to take you back to that moment when you first found out about that particular natural history auction in New York in 2007. How did you feel in that moment? What was it? Why did you come across that in the first place? What made it stick with you? And at what moment did you think, I'm going to write a book about this and it's going to be a discussion among the items that are up for auction. It's a wild idea. How did you go from seeing the thing about the auction to coming up with that idea? Supplementary question, which you don't have to answer now. How did you get a publisher to think to get on board with that? It's an awesome book, but um, yeah, it does kind of stretch the bounds of what normally happens in publishing and well done for doing that. I was already interested in mammoths um, because I'd read that President Jefferson was trying to secure the skeleton of one back in 1800 in order to show everyone how macho he was. Then when I heard that mammoth bones and those of other dinosaurs and megafauna were still on sale at today, I thought, how could I resist? Especially since Nicolas Cage bought the Tyrannosaurus skull at the 2007 auction. I thought, what stories could these bones tell? And Mammoth is my exploration of that. As for convincing a publisher, it wasn't as tough as I thought. UQP were instantly enthusiastic for the proposition, and I think they've enjoyed the process of creating the book just as much as I have. I suspect that there's an appetite for stories that are offbeat, funny, entertaining, and uplifting. And hopefully Mammoth is all of those. It's me, Kelly Thompson. I've started reading your new book, Mammoth, and the one question that just keeps popping in my mind is, what inspired you to write a book from the point of view of the mammoth? Where did the mammoth come from? Were you drunk? I have no idea, but I'd really love to know. Why the mammoth specifically? Thanks, Kelly. Uh, unusually, I wasn't drunk at the time. Um, the mammoth is not only a majestic beast that haunts our dreams and captures our imagination, but it's also the creature that might save us from ourselves. Uh, teams of scientists around the world are right now working on cloning the mammoth back to life. The idea is to recreate a herd and then release them in rewilded Siberia so they can stomp down the snow and try to halt the permafrost from melting. Mammoths aren't going to reverse climate change, but they might slow it down, which will buy us some time to get our act together. We could actually see baby mammoths within a year. The Jurassic Park fantasy runs deep in us all, so I personally can't wait to hear their mighty trumpet call. Thank you for your question. Hi Chris, it's um, Tony Birch. Um, I've just finished your fantastic um, new novel, Mammoth. Um, I've read all your books and really loved them. And one of the things I'm interested in is that in your work, you're not a realist novelist. You have this great ability to get a hold of the truth and to stretch it and to reshape it. But in doing that, I always think that you are trying to engage with or your work is dealing with essential truths about society. And uh, I just wonder if you could respond to that and give me some sense of if I'm on the right track, I suppose. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. You're right, as you always are. Um, stretching the truth can reveal the truth. That's the essential nature of fiction. In Mammoth, I, I love treading the, that line between fact and fiction. Although it seems unlikely, um, given all the bizarre snippets of information in the book, I would say about 80% of it is factual. The narrative framework of having fossils tell their stories is made up, of course. But I like the idea of animals observing us humans and learning truths about us that perhaps we fail to recognize. We live in an age where the truth seems more fluid than ever before, and yet the truth has a habit of sneaking up on us and revealing itself in all its awkward glory, whether we like it or not. Yeah, look, 
I haven't yet received a copy of your so-called book, but I don't think I need to read it to be able to pinpoint its fundamental flaws. As I understand it, you've written a book called Mammoth, which clearly is a Watership Down style narrative told from the point of view of a mammoth. My question to you is this, do you in fact identify as a mammoth? And if not, is this not an example of cultural appropriation of the very worst kind? And I tell you what, I've got a second part to my question. How would you feel if a mammoth wrote a book called Chris Flynn? There, I'd be better to raise the potentially career-ending, controversial question of cultural appropriation. Thanks for your support, Mark. Yes, the book is written in the voice of a mammoth and other animals. For five years while I was writing the book, I worked at the RSPCA. So I'm more than happy to be an advocate for and voice of any animal who's been abused by dumb humans. Incidentally, Mark, I noticed from the pile of dirty clothes in the background of your video that you seem to be working from your laundry again, or perhaps now living in someone's laundry. I know your books about dead soldiers are very popular in RSLs around the nation and have sold in the dozens, but mate, I asked you to send me a question, not a cry for help. Incidentally, I'm sending around a load of fine coloured linens for you to wash, so please put them on at 30 degrees, gentle cycle. Oh, but who am I to tell you your business? Hi, my name's Meg Keneally, and I would like to ask Chris about the role of Tyrannosaurus batar in Mammoth's story, apart from allowing Chris to uh, live out a boyhood fantasy about creating a talking dinosaur. I mean, come on, you can tell without even opening the book that the guys are paleo-tragic. Uh, I did open the book, and I'm very glad that I did, and you should open it too immediately after buying it. But first, let's hear what Chris has to say for himself on the subject of tea batar. Are you ready? Thank you, Meg, for that passive-aggressive question. I expect nothing less. Tyrannosaurus plays a pivotal role in Mammoth. He's also on sale at the Natural History Auction, as was the real Tyrannosaurus that had been smuggled out of Mongolia. He was bought for $276,000 by Hollywood legend Nicolas Cage. The Cage ultimately had to give the Tyrannosaurus skull back, and he was repatriated to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, where he still lives today. His favourite movie is now Con Air. Debate rages uh, in the novel between the mammoth and the Tyrannosaurus as to the role of Tibetar's tiny little hands. For such a fearsome dinosaur, the ultimate apex predator, his hands seem especially useless. What purpose did they serve? All will be revealed in Mammoth. Hey Chris Flynn, it's Elizabeth Gilbert, and I have a question for you about your book Mammoth, which as you well know, I absolutely love. My question is about the English that is spoken by the mammoth. What did you decide on that in terms of where to put the mammoth's language chronologically? Meaning, is mammoth speaking in 19th century English, in 21st century English, or in 13,000 years ago English? Which of course didn't exist 13,000 years ago. Um, but yeah, how did you decide where to set him uh, in terms of uh, idiom and uh, style and cant of language. That is my question. Love the book, as you well know. Excellent question, Liz. In the book, an ancient language is referenced that all the animals speak. Um, but the fossils learn English and other languages corresponding to where and when they are dug up. Thus, the mammoth speaks a grand 19th century English learned from educated Americans, whereas the Tyrannosaurus learnt English from dock workers in Miami in the 1990s. The penguin spent most of his fossil life hanging over a bar in Boston. This will all become painfully apparent when the audiobook is released. I'm not reading it, as the animals would sound particularly strange in my accent. Instead, we have an amazing actor, Rupert Degas, who will perform all the voices. It's going to sound incredible. Our mammoth, we've decided, sounds a little like Orson Welles, so keep your ears open for that.